Yeah, I think it's something that. Sorry, you me. Uh, good morning, everyone, and I love you, Amelia, and thank you so much for having me here uh, on the Breakfast of Champions. But I think being an entrepreneur is something you know that's being ignored. And for those of you that want to work within the context of corporations, uh, you know it is an area that you can thrive if you want to be hired by corporations because they are losing people to entrepreneurship, they are losing people to the individuality and remote working. And if you can utilize your knowledge of an entrepreneur, how to be creative and curious, how to have the stability of a large company, but yet still your own business unit, your own innovation, all the attributes of an entrepreneur, but with the stability of an entrepreneur, you're going to be so successful. It's a huge market that I'm looking at and want to highly suggest so many of us start looking at entrepreneurism, not just entrepreneurism, and what are the aspects of being successful within a large company, and being successful within that large company, we can help so many more people, because although we're starting more companies than ever, there's still a great need to have enough people at these big companies, and there's a lot of opportunity in equity, there's a lot of opportunity in stability, in salary, commissions, and bonuses, and I think a lot of people are ignoring a huge opportunity in our economy of working with those different people. So uh, entrepreneurship is an area that I'm focusing on, and you'll see a lot of branding and videos about entrepreneurship. Thank you so much. We're here, BYOQ. You bring the questions, I'll bring the answers. I love Fridays. I love Breakfast of Champions, Glenn, Lundy, Amelia, and all the rest of the crew here. This is my favorite community. Thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead, Jake. He, so, he sounds like Charlie Brown. <laughs> Welcome everyone. It is Friday training. We got BYOQ. You bring the questions. I'll bring the answer. When someone else meets you, when someone else meets you, it'll reset. Thank you, Brielle. And thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Okay, Dave, we've got a question here from Instagram. The question is from Blaine. The question is, what are the components of a perfect fish? Uh, you know, obviously been through a lot of pitches with elevator pitch uh, which is coming out with season number seven uh, two minute drill which is a two minute pitch show uh, there's five component components of the pitch but before we get to the pitch I want to remind everyone pitch to an open mind uh, it takes a thousand times the effort energy money and value to re-engineer a closed mind that does an open mind uh, I have an open-minded template I've been giving people to show them how to quickly assess whether someone has a closed mind or an open mind. So it does you no good to pitch to a closed mind. Uh, trust me, even if they're the perfect avatar of what you've been looking for your entire life or your company's entire existence, it doesn't matter. A perfect avatar with a closed mind is a waste of time. Find an open mind and then qualify them through your pitch whether they're sponsors, they, which means they know somebody that can help you, or a power sponsor, meaning they can help you and they know someone that can help you. But when we find an open mind, what we want to do is, number one, we want to make sure that we are credible. I can't tell you how many people overlook the most important part of a pitch, which is credibility. Uh, illuminating all the weaknesses, all the mistakes that we've made, illuminating any past transgressions that you've had, credibility of not overselling, back-end selling, lying, manipulating, and cheating, thinking you're doing yourself service by uh, um, omitting things. You need to work through credibility because people are not as, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say as dumb as they look. I would be speaking to myself. I'm not as dumb as I look, and obviously people think I am because they'll go ahead and oversell, back and sell, lie, manipulate, and try to cheat me on their pitch, even on the TV show. Uh, and all you've done is open a can of worms and send me down a hole of skepticism, which then ruins all the credible things that you have to say. The second component is emotional attachment. You know, like Maya Angelou says, people will not remember what you said, they'll remember the way they feel. That's why there's so many dogs, by the way, in so many commercials that you see. Why? Because they make us feel good. And so, you know, if you remember the Hyundai commercial that listed out five cars in a row from biggest to smallest, but put five dogs right by them from biggest to smallest, they didn't care if you looked at the, 
the cars. All they wanted to do is make you feel good. And pets and dogs in general, they make us feel good. They give us a dose. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins are released when we see or are comforted by an animal. And so what they want you to do is feel good and then identify, oh yeah, that was Hyundai. And that makes me feel good. I'm going to go buy one of those cars because it makes me feel good. So credibility, emotional attachment. Then it comes to the math. The three next components in a pitch are all about math. Uh, the quantitative value of the math. In order to have a successful pitch, you have to reach one threshold. And that threshold is to be able to articulate the quantitative value to exceed what you're asking for. See, a lot of people in their mind think they can show or illustrate or their deck did or they did. They can illustrate the quantitative value to exceed what they're asking for because they know everything about it. But in two minutes to pitch or five minutes to pitch or 20 minutes to pitch, uh, they can't do what you've known for your entire existence with the desire that you must be what you can be with all the investment that you've made into the company or the pitch that you have given. So you need to make sure that you can articulate the value to exceed what you're asking for. And the way we do that is one, quantify the reasons somebody should do what you're pitching. Two, quantify the impact that it has. Uh, especially nowadays, impact is extremely important. And then understand the capabilities, your own desire and knowledge and your own skills or the company service or solution skills, knowledge and desire in order to effectuate those reasons and impacts. And so when you can quantify and articulate the quantified valuable to exceed what you're asking for with reasons, impacts, and capabilities tied into the emotional feel good and alongside always staying credible, integral, and being able to illuminate the weaknesses and the omissions that other people don't. I promise you, you will have the statistical success in a pitch like you've never seen before. And guess what? It requires one thing, practice. <laughs> the number one reason that people don't pitch well is the number one reason they don't do other things well is they're not enjoying the consistent, persistent pursuit of the perfect pitch. They're not practicing. Uh, when I pitch, I still practice in front of a mirror. I videotape myself. I auto record myself. I'm listening to myself to see the subtleties of how and what I say and where the intonation and connotation belongs. That doesn't happen by accident. It's an extraordinary amount of practice that goes into each of those. So the more you practice the credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, and capabilities, you too can have a perfect, perfect pitch with a, <clears throat> that efficiency, effectiveness, and statistical success you want. But remember rule number one of pitching, find an open mind. Anybody wants that open-minded template, by the way, that has allowed me to not only find an open mind, but to determine whether they're a sponsor or a power sponsor, just reach out to me in my bio. You got my email. Jake will give it to you. Please, I would be happy to change my life. Let's all find open minds. Open minds surround themselves with like minds, which just increases the exponentiality and the reach and the amplification of everything you're asking for and allows you to provide more service and value to them as well. All right, this is David Meltzer on BYOQ, The Breakfast of Champions. You bring the questions, I'll bring the answers. Let's get fired up. It's Friday. Thank you, Jakey Bakey. Let's do this, Dave. Thank you for that. We are all looking for the open minds, always. Okay, we've got questions coming in from everywhere. Thank you so much, everybody. We're going to take our first question here live on Clubhouse from the one and only Brielle. So, Brielle, if you could please unmute yourself and welcome to the Clubhouse. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, you know, Dave, here on Clubhouse, I get this question a lot, and I think you'd be the perfect person to answer it. When you're just in a space and you feel stuck, you're not sure how to move forward or what direction do you go in, what do you do? What do you do when you feel stuck? Do you ever feel stuck? What should we do? Thank you, Brielle. And I, for whatever reason, I do not thank you enough. So I come on here now, Amelia, Glenn, Brielle, thank you always. I know you're out there being of service and value to everyone and helping people with these. So uh, please forgive me and thank you for your patience if I have omitted your name so many different times. You are wonderful. Uh, this is really important because I have a philosophy about being stuck. Get stuck getting stuck. See, the only reason you feel stuck is that you cannot, with your faulty senses, the way you see things, hear things, feel things, touch things, you can't recognize the progress that you're making. So as long as you are instituting the three laws, then you will 
be able to see eventually the results of your positive behavior or your negative behavior. But if you realize, one, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm at the right place at the perfect time. You will reduce and resolve a lot of the resistance that we put when our emotions are attached to an outcome, which is the effect of feeling stuck. So in order to dissolve or dissipate those emotions and resistance, number one, institute the law of gravity that says I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm at the right way at the perfect time. Now you're not stuck because you're already there where you're supposed to be. Then you can institute the law of Goya, which everyone knows John Asheroff taught me years ago, G-O-Y-A. Get off your ass, enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of your potential, not what other people want for you, not what's missing, not what you don't want, but what you want based off of your five daily practices of knowing your what, your who, your how, your now, and applying your why. But if you institute everything you have, the desire that you must be what you can be, with knowing that you're exactly where you're supposed to be at the right place at the perfect time, you now will create a void for the universe to fill. You now will create and expand and accelerate and exponentially grow. You will allow life to come through you. You see, life is longing for itself, so it's impossible for you to feel stuck. And when you feel stuck, it's just a matter that you haven't put the mindset, the heart set, and what that conscious activity that you have going on into the respect of gravity and Goya to allow things to happen. See, the last law, the law of allowance, the law of attraction, I call it the law of faith, says this, I'm doing everything I can to get to where I wanna be, but I have faith I'm gonna be somewhere better. So if I feel stuck, stuck, it's just the recognition that I'm not where I wanna be, so I have to dissolve and dissipate the emotional attachment to where I think I wanna be, and the law of faith, the law of allowance, and the law of attraction say, I'm gonna end up somewhere better. See, there's only two types of people, Brielle. There's ignorant people, and there's ignorant people. See, the difference between the two types of people, though, is there's arrogant, ignorant people that won't admit they don't know what they don't know. So they project their insecurities that they know everything or they know everything about at least one thing. And those are the people that will get stuck, I promise you. Then there's humble, ignorant people. And the humble people say, I don't know what I don't know. I live with rule number six in mind. Rule number six in mind is created by the Xanders, by the way. Uh, rule number six says... I'm not taking myself so seriously. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna do my best. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna learn something. It does mean I'm gonna have fun in everything you do. And it does mean it'll dissipate, dissolve, and disappear all those feelings of stuckness and understand that I'm just consistently, persistently enjoying the pursuit of my potential, instituting the law of gravity, Goya, allowance, attraction, allowing things to happen by understanding what I am already. See, when you know you are healthy, happy, wealthy, and worthy, you're just inter getting rid of what interferes with what you already are. That's where the law of faith says all this pain, all this stuckness, all these struggles, setbacks, failures, and mistakes, they're propelling me to a better place, a better position, in a better situation. They're not punishing me. They're not holding me down. I'm not living the myth of Sisyphus, pushing a boulder to the top of the hill just to have it roll down at the beginning of every day. No, I'm plateauing and growing, instituting the five daily practices of what, who, how, now, and applying my why. Law of gravity, law of Goya, and the law of faith. All of these things will allow you to get stuck being stuck and realize that's how I get to where I want to be. Nope. That's how I get to a place that's better than I want to be. This is David Meltzer. Thank you so much for real bringing up that important question. from everyone you know people attack us they have judgments and conditions uh especially if you, you put the pieces together. Exactly. hey make sure that's muted jakey well, thank you like sorry about that can you mute that sorry um anyway um 
there's, you know, especially on social media, people attack you. And if you have a need to be offended, this can be a serious interference to what you are and the acceleration growth and compound interest that you want in your life when you start looking at what other people want for you. And when you realize that you give meaning to everything you see, but so does everybody else. And if somebody has a need to attack, a need to judge, or a need to put condition, separation, inferiority, or superiority into the context of me and them, the relativity between the two of us, there's only two things I need to do. One is to understand where they're coming from. Because where they're coming from is what they're giving out. And the more that I can understand why they would project those attacks and conditions and judgments onto me to try to diminish my capacity of sharing my light and liberating other people to share their light, I can get a better understanding of how I can be of service or value to them by what? Not only praying for their happiness, but actually trying to make them happy by doing good deeds, by being kind and kind to my future self and to them and teaching them and empowering them, not by what they hear, by what they see. And they learn just like children, right? It's not what I say, it's what they hear and what they see is how and what impacts them and provides the seeds in which will be the trees that them or other people will sit under. And so what I do, um, understanding how things work is I pray for their happiness. Happiness is the truth. Happiness is the most viral of all diseases. It's shared simply by giving it, by receiving it, and by witnessing it. So I know you can put your mask on all you want. You're still going to catch my happiness, and it's going to change your life more than anything else. So I'm praying for happiness as a good deed in order to effectuate knowing that happy people don't judge. Happy people don't put conditions of inferiority, superiority, or separateness on things. And happy people do not attack. Happy people are here to be of service and of value. They're looking to at least have at least 10 people in front of them that they can help. And also that 10 people will come into their lives that can help them. They're in the flow. Happy people will empower others to empower others to be happy. And in the pragmatic sense, I teach people to make a lot of money help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. That's how I truly pragmatically pray for their happiness by empowering them to create abundance by making a lot of money, helping a lot of people and having a lot of fun. So everybody here, let's take one second. Let's pray for each other's happiness and create abundance of more than enough for everyone. Thank you so much. This is David Meltzer, BYOQ. You bring the questions, I'll bring the answers. Loving it here on Breakfast of Champions. Thank you. Champions here on Friday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific time. We're here with the Power Hour with David Meltzer. Thank you, everybody, for joining. If you'd like to ask a question, we've got about 41 minutes. Please feel free to back channel me, uh, and I will aim to bring you up. And then, of course, David is currently live on his Friday training on Instagram and LinkedIn, so feel free to ask these questions wherever you'd like. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And also, let's take a quick second. Uh, follow the people next to you. Follow the people on stage. Really trying to create an unbelievable community here on the best room on Clubhouse, the Breakfast of Champions. So we've got uh, incredible questions so far. Next up, it's uh, Frank Beanie, who is a fellow San Diegan. So Frank, if you could please unmute yourself and welcome to the Clubhouse. Good morning, you all, and thank you all so much for having me. Uh, my name is Frank Beanie. I am a uh, San Diegan as well and a uh, current uh, MBA student at the University of San Diego. We actually just started last week. Uh, Dave, I learned about you through one of my fraternity brothers who works uh, for you named Nick Laser. And I know he's doing amazing, amazing things with you and just really appreciate all of your leadership. My question for you is, since we just started my, our MBA program, we have been taking a class this week on strategic decision making for entrepreneurs. And so my question for you is, as an entrepreneur, what has been the hardest decision you've ever had to make? And in making, what do you think about and how did you make that decision? I think the hardest is... I'm Frank and I'm finished speaking. Thank you, Frank, and I appreciate it. And thank you, Nick, as well. What an extraordinary uh, intern he's been for me. Um, the hardest decision to make as an entrepreneur is to believe in ourselves. And we have to make that every day. Uh, you, you see, it takes so long to get to where we want to be or to have faith that we're going to be somewhere better uh, in entrepreneurship. And there are no overnight successes. Even if people have had success at a young age, it just means they started earlier. 
and they may or may not have had the directive in which they achieved uh, but i promise you there are no overnight successes and so the biggest decision to make is to stay in business uh, it's so easy to get too far above our skis or too far below our skis or to listen to people that laugh at me, scoff at me and make fun of me, uh, to listen to the advice of people who love me, uh, even though they don't know what the hell they're talking about, uh, to listen to the arrogance of the ignorance, not the humility of the ignorance, uh, to stay in business and to make the decision to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my own potential. I, I use a story, Frank. Uh, about Jeff Bezos and got misinterpreted on TikTok, which just helped me because I got millions of, of views from it. But <laughs> this story goes like this. If I would have met Jeff Bezos 25 years ago, which I did not, but if I would have, and I met him in his garage when he was selling books online, and he told me, David, I'm going to be the richest man on earth. I'm going to create the greatest marketplace in the world. And I'd say, well, what do you do? And I sell books online. Huh. I would have laughed at him, scoffed at him, and made fun. Now, I'm an optimist. I, I'm actually a toptimist, right? I'm the top of the optimist. I have been able to, like Victor Frankl, find the light, the love, and the lessons in anything. I can find the light, the love, and the lessons in a dirty water fish head soup and learn through mindset, heart set, and my conscious continuum to love it. But I still would have laughed at him. It was so outrageous. Uh, and at that time... The reason I would have laughed at him is because his reality surpassed my imagination. I live my life in entrepreneurism, in entrepreneurism, that I want my reality to surpass other people's imagination because I make the decision every day, as Shakespeare says, to, own, to thine own self be true. And I think with all the pressure that we face, from the enormity of the size, scope, and scale of the relativity of how we're connected to and through so many people in so many ways, in person, on the phone, via email and media, traditional and social media, that's so difficult, especially for young entrepreneurs, to believe to thy own self be true, true. And to make that decision to be thy own self is the most important decision that you'll make as an entrepreneur to stay in business and to create a business better than you can even imagine. So let's all make our realities surpass everyone else's imagination. Let allow the universe to expand and grow and to long for itself and allow that life and that world to come through you with appreciation, adding value to it, expanding it, growing it, and accelerating it, to give it away. Because remember, you cannot acknowledge, you cannot remember, you cannot remind yourself what you have until you've given it away. That's when we know what we've had. That's when we've expanded our void for the universe to fill with more. With more. Thank you, this is David. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate both of you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Frank. Okay, Dave, we've got a question here on the Friday training. The question is, uh, what is the most common mistake that you see entrepreneurs make when building their own personal brand? Can you please expand on that? Yeah, two, two mistakes, uh, and they were both made for you. I was blessed. Um, I helped uh, Gary Vaynerchuk and AJ with their sports agency, I asked him to help me build my brand, and Gary, being as abundant as he can, gave me five minutes a week to help me build my brand. And for the, almost the first year, the first piece of advice that he gave, he looked at my Instagram, and I said, what do you think? He said, man, great content. Post more. Next week, great content. Post more. Next week, great content. Post more. So uh, to build your brand, you got to have a brand. You have to raise the awareness of who you are. You have to raise the awareness through consistent, good content. Your content will continue to get better, uh, but you need to put thought into that brand of what your frequency is. To thy own self be true uh, with that frequency. But you got to let people know who you are. Uh, and then secondly, to build your brand, you have to understand another Shakespearean law. To thy own self be true, but also the whole world is your stage. So not only do you need to post, but you have to realize that everything that you do in person on the phone via email, traditional media, and social media should be captured, should be modified for all the different platforms, amplified through all the channel partners and platforms, 
and perpetuated where possible so that you can continually aggregate your brand, accelerate your brand, compound the interest of your brand exponentially so that it builds like Noah's Ark, two by two by two by two. Go ahead and use the exponential factor of two and see that within 20 permeations of two times two times two, it equals two million times two and that equals 4 million, then 8 million, then 16 million. So whatever the segmentation of the amount of time that it takes to double your twos, that's what you should be after when you're building that brand. It only comes from being consistent and persistent with your band by posting more, by capturing what you are and who you are and how you are and your, the why you are, by doing so, modifying it correctly, by using the knowledge of others to figure out where the best and what the best is to post, and then amplifying it through all the people that are relative to you and perpetuating it for future use and monetization. Utilize to thy own self be true. Utilize the stage theory. Post more than you ever thought you would. I would say until your family and friends tell you you're annoying and you're posting too much, you haven't reached the minimum amount that you should be posting. Uh, this is Dave Meltzer and find your frequency, strengthen it and the spectrum and you will build a brand and detach your emotions from the outcome. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Find your frequency and the Noah's Ark strategy. Two by two by two. That's uh, an official way to build your brand among other things. Thank you so much, Dave. Okay, we've got Mike Mamola here on Clubhouse. Mike, if you could please unmute yourself and welcome to the Clubhouse. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dave and Jake. Thank you. I don't thank you enough, and thank you not only for bringing me up, but for also doing such a tremendous job every day. Dave, I want to go back to something that you said with regard to credibility. <clears throat> you know, working on uh, NFTs and the things that I'm so passionate about right now is partly because of that, right? The, the digital or technological instant verification, authenticity, and credibility of what's being done. But like you said, when we're dealing with people very often, you know, startups and pitches or whatever they're doing, they might not be as credible as they think they are. <clears throat> and we know that credibility, like any other thought or emotion, is a vibrational frequency that we carry. If we can carry it the right way at an elevating state, we become more of the flower rather than the big. And so when we're going out trying to sell companies and everything, it becomes easier. We know some of the best companies sell themselves. That's because they're more of a flower than the big. How do we become that? How do people, like the people that I work with, I don't think they overtly know that they're not being credible. They're not being honest with themselves. Is it through mentorship? Is it through working with partners to help them tap into and identify and solve the problems that they have with being not only honest with themselves, but then with others and what they're doing? Okay. Yeah, the way that we help other people with their integrity, with their credibility, is to trust them and vet them. You know, I talked about this last week in training, uh, that trusting and vetting are one and the same. Once I shifted my own perspective of vetting, you know, I used to think that I was discrediting people by vetting them, that I was offending them by vetting them, by asking hard questions, somehow it was uncomfortable. But actually what I was doing was acknowledging and helping them by asking the hard questions, uh, by asking actual money questions, by asking you know who, what, where, when, and how questions that everybody's afraid to ask. And then when things don't work out, we blame them for what we already knew, that they were lying, cheating, overselling, manipulating uh, us um, with good intentions usually. Uh, most people, right, if they're lying to themselves, they don't even know they're lying to you. I used to get offended when people lied to me and now I just realize, well, they don't know. They're lying to themselves. They're just projecting that onto me and they you know, believe uh, very few people intentionally oversell, back and sell, lie, manipulate, or cheat uh, intentionally. Uh, and if they do, they bet out really quickly. Uh, but you have to ask our question. There's a book written by Stephen Hertz called Don't Take Yes for an Answer. Uh, it's part of the problem that helped uh, create all the interference in my life when I lost over a hundred million dollars. It was because nobody was uh, saying no to me. Nobody was vetting me. Everybody was just letting me live my life, lying to myself and unhappiness, buying things that I didn't need to impress people I didn't like. And they all would suck up to me, to my face and then leave me and ask all the hard questions behind my back. But it didn't stop them from going on trips with me, allowing me to buy them things, host them, party, whatever it is, give them access to all the greatest things on earth. But yet, the minute they left me, they were telling the truth. The best way that we can help people is to vet them, especially the people that we love, that we truly trust. 
you need to use no. You need to tell people, hey, that doesn't sound right. You know, what do you, what do you mean by that? These are hard questions that people are afraid to ask, especially of our children. You know, so many times parents do not want to bring up difficult uh, questions. Now, I don't tell my kids what to do, right? I just poise questions to them or share stories with lessons contained within the stories and then allow them to effectually make decisions from what they've learned. All I ask them to do is to do their best, learn lessons and have fun with their life. And I know if they do their best and learn lessons and have fun, that they will not only manifest what they desire, but they'll manifest better than that they even expected because they'll continue to learn and grow and accelerate and expand and allow the positive behaviors to compound on themselves without an attachment to those positive behaviors and the outcome that they expect, but utilizing faith that they'll end up somewhere better. So vet, 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 Mike, and you're doing somebody a favor, asking them. Look, when someone's asking you the hard questions, they just care about you. They, they, it's not that they don't distrust you. It's actually the opposite. They trust you so much. They care so much about you. They want to make sure that you're living in integrity. This is David Meltzer. Love to have the next question. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Mike, for the question. Okay, Dave, we've got a question from LinkedIn from Gabriel. The question is, David, as a best-selling author, how do you go about your preparation, process, and execution? Yeah, so I don't think... Uh, the best-selling author necessarily makes me credible to, to give you this information, but I've written eight books, and so I have a lot of practice at it. Um, and so it, it's all about lessons and stories to me. Um, and then writing your book in the context of how you best communicate. So if you're, you know, like handwriting, then handwrite. If you like the old typewriter, use an old typewriter. If you like the computer, use that. I'm uh, an auditory person. So uh, I teach my books. I record them, transcribe them, edit them, send them to a publisher, have them re-edit it, and add my own research, etc. So I have a process. So number one, the process has to be indicative of how you best communicate. Two, create a repository of all the lessons and stories you learn. Remember the 12 lessons of Sanskrit. The 12 lessons of Sanskrit that tell us that life is about lessons. The lessons will keep on coming until you learn them. You will forget every lesson you've ever learned, but you have the ability to remember those lessons or access those lessons. So create a process not only to write your book, which is in the context of how you communicate, but most importantly, live life by codifying the lessons that you love, that uh, are aligned with to thine own self the true, that are aligned with your frequency, that will strengthen your frequency. So I have a folder with a ton of different lessons, and then I tell stories about those lessons. Some are true, some are exaggerated, but they all are meant for one purpose, to teach the lesson, to teach the lesson. Some are other people's stories that are tied or stories about other people. It doesn't matter. The greatest thing is I don't write out the stories. I notate the stories because then I tell the stories differently every time. I allow the stories to grow, expand, and accelerate. I allow the stories to gain their clarity. So it's not what I, people hear in the stories, right? It's not what I say in the stories, it's what people hear. Most people make the biggest mistake when writing a book that they don't tie in the lessons and the stories, organize them efficiently and effectively in whatever the bigger overall theme is. So, for example, I'm writing a book right now called Don't Do Business with Dicks. Not Dicks Disoriented, by the way. And uh, there's a ton of lessons that I've learned because I've surrounded myself with the wrong people and the wrong ideas. I've surrounded myself and interfered with what I already am, happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. And so I've gone through my repository, a whole list of lessons with notated stories next to it, organized it into 10 chapters, and I'm currently writing each chapter, and then I'll go and read each chapter, write an introduction, then I'll read it again and write the conclusion. I also seek help. So along the way, I have publishing consultants that will write questions and vet me and say, this doesn't sound honest, this isn't right, Go do research. This sounds like a Meltzerism. Totally woo-woo. Nobody's going to get what you're saying. This whole frequency, vibration, bullshit, tracing calligraphies or whatever else. They call me on my BS and then make sure that not only am I strengthening my signal in a book, not only am I speaking to the spectrum of people that have been able to tune in to what I say, but more importantly, they clarify my message so that they can understand the lessons in a better way, a more enjoyable, entertaining way. 
So create a lot repository of those lessons and stories, create uh, a way to organize them, ask for help from those people that have sit in this situation that you want to be in. I'm happy to help anybody with this. I help tons of people uh, organize and figure out how best to communicate the lessons and stories that they want to tell. Uh, so just go ahead, look at my bio, reach out to me. Happy to give that to you. Jake, this is David Meltzer. Why don't you reset the room real quick? It's BYOQ on Breakfast of Champions. Thank you, Dave. The BYOQ, and if you'd like, as Dave mentioned, David's email is david at dmeltzer.com. That's david at dmeltzer.com. Uh, if you'd like the, uh, the, the lessons of Sanskrit, I'm sure David is happy to send you those as well. So we're here on the Breakfast of Champions, 6 a.m. Pacific time, 9 a.m. Eastern time. It's been an incredible 36 minutes so far. We've got about 24 minutes left. Feel free, uh, if you'd like to ask a question here on Clubhouse, just use the back channel and we will aim to bring up as many people as possible. Uh, thank you again, David. We've got next up Sean Walchev here on Clubhouse. So, Sean, if you can please unmute yourself and welcome to the Thanks, Jake. Thank you, David, for having me. Uh, full disclosure, David is my business and media mentor. We're trying to build the Amazon Prime of Barbecue in San Diego, and David has been instrumental in doing that, and uh, I'm grateful to be here on Clubhouse. Uh, David always says you're exactly where you're supposed to be, and I, just from the lessons and stories that he's sharing about Gary Vaynerchuk and Jeff Bezos this morning, I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. So, uh, David, my question for you is two-part. Number one, on Instagram, I noticed it is David Meltzer Espanol, so you've launched your third Instagram account, so you're following Gary Vee's advice of posting more. Uh, why did you do that? And then number two, why is every business in the media business? You've already talked about Shakespeare, which is one of my favorite topics you talked about, so I will unmute the mic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. And I love the fact that Sean uh, started with one small uh, barbecue store in Springfield, uh, Spring Valley, uh, San Diego, and uh, would not believe the size, scope, and scale of not only the barbecue business, but the media side of what he does worldwide with Yelp. Uh, and soon to be launching, you know, with the major publication as well. So congratulations, Sean. Um, you know, I have a lot of different accounts uh, that I use. Some are test accounts, uh, but as my brand has grown, uh, there's such a huge population that speaks Spanish uh, that has reached out. And uh, because of the subtleties of my use of language and vocabulary and the nuances of how I speak, I wanted it to be translated into Spanish to carry the frequency that I have. So I will be launching more and more types of Instagram accounts for two reasons. One is to test uh, and two is to reach. Uh, so those are the reasons I use so many accounts uh, to reach different people uh, in different languages, different areas and different genres. I even split up my podcast. So I've had, you know, over a thousand episodes of my podcast. It was entrepreneurs. Uh, the playbook and then Blue Wire uh, licensed it. So now we have a studio at the Wynn Hotel in the lobby and it's Blue Wire's sports and entertainment playbook. Uh, so you can get all the sports and entertainment people on one, the entrepreneurs in a mix and max between the two as well. So, uh, you know, understanding the segmentation and the spectrum that you want to reach is so important. You cannot be everything to everyone unless that's what you want to be, right? If you want to be a TikTok star with 10 million you know, viewers and hold up products and get paid that way, that's super cool. I'm looking for ambassadorship. I'm looking to empower a thousand people that truly understand the values and the daily practices that it takes to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun, but not only learn that themselves, but empower them to empower others, another thousand to empower another thousand. So the depth of knowledge, the subtleties in what they know, like you, Sean, I know you're one of those thousand for me that will carry forward and pay forward the values and the daily practices that we consistently go over and keep learning and sharing and growing together. It's so important to speak to that spectrum. Um, and then the media side, you know, I'm buying up a bunch of billboards right now. Uh, and people are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I'm buying all over the country a bunch of billboards. And what I'm doing, because they're really cheap, by the way, uh, is that people will still drive by those. And I'll still get what used to be about 10 times. It cost about 10 times as much to buy a billboard. Uh, but I can create such unique content off of that billboard. And I also can change the billboards digitally to say different things. 
so that not only can I have the aspect of people driving by the billboards, but I can have videos of the people driving by the billboards commenting. I can have stories about the billboards, use it as a B-roll. I can capture the billboard in a million different ways, modify it in even more ways, amplify it in even more ways, and even better than buying the billboards, or leasing the billboards, I should say, uh, I perpetuate the billboard so that 20 years from now, when someone sees a billboard that says, be kind to your future self, do good deeds, uh, it will still be there. And so I get, no pun intended, so much more mileage out of a billboard than ever before. And the cost of that billboard is far less than what a production stage would be. And the amount of content that I can create around the country and exposure awareness uh, and clarity of my message can be spread. So look for your billboards in your industry. Where can you capture, modify, amplify, and perpetuate your content in order to effectuate great value uh, and also ask for help. This is David Meltzer and one of my star pupils, Sean Walton. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for asking uh, that question. Uh, Dave said, look for the billboards in your industry. That was a, a great lesson. Thank you, David. Okay, we've got a question here on the Zoom Friday training. The question is, uh, speaking about woo-woo stuff, Dave, uh, what do you tell people who don't believe in woo-woo stuff? How can, how can they get over their, their thoughts on not believing in woo-woo? Yeah. So what you mean by woo-woo is probably more spiritual, weird stuff like me tracing calligraphies, uh, which I'm going to do a demonstration with Master Dr. Shaw who was on here last week. Uh, I think it's August 31st at 1.15 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, how do I feel about weird shit? Um, and I wear bracelets, I trace calligraphies, but you're also talking to a person that in its general sense, didn't believe in this at all, but yet, um, and I'm gonna admit this to everybody, I wore the same socks for three years when I graduated law school because I thought the reason I became a millionaire and had such success in business was my lucky socks. Now, it's a lot safer to trace calligraphies and wear, you know, bless bracelets or, you know, do, you know, many other things that you can do spiritually or woo-woo, quote-unquote, than wear the same socks for three straight years, even when they had holes in them, uh, I was wearing them. Uh, it actually has some risk, uh, at least in your dating life, it has a lot of risk. <laughs> so uh, I have rules about you know doing different things. One, what is the risk? What is the risk? Does it, it could it and does it create any harm to myself or to others? I promise you, when I trace calligraphies, it has no risk of harming anyone, myself or my family or anyone around me. Um, and the second question is really super important. Does it work for you? Not for everybody else. Does it work for you? I share the things that work for me. I share the things about lessons and stories. I share the things about the stage theory. I share the things about, you know, to thy own self. All these things work for me. And they have no risk to you. And they have no risk to me. But they may not work for you. And that's okay. Because I'm ignorant and humble. I don't know what I don't know. I don't take myself so seriously. But I love sharing what works for me. And people like me, it seems to work for. People not like me, it doesn't work for. And so the big question is, is to do a timing and risk assessment. What is the risk of doing it? How much time does it take? Do I have better things to spend my time doing? But also, you know, does it work? If it works for you, because my smelly, stinky socks work for me. But eventually, it just the risk became too great with athlete's foot, and I really wanted to get married, and it, I just couldn't understand why nobody wanted to go out with me again. You know, I thought it was my haircut, I thought it was my height, I thought it was my nose. No, nope, it was my socks. So that was the only risk that I determined, so I decided I'm going to find something else that works for me instead of wearing the same socks every day. Uh, I did wash them once in a while, but I promise you it probably wasn't the best decision for woo-woo practice was to wear the same socks. Anyway, find out what socks you want to wear. If it has no risk and it works for you, please do it. This is David Meltzer. It's Breakfast of Champions, BYOQ. You bring the questions, I'll bring the answer. Uh, let's all share in radical humility. We know we're ignorant, but let's do our best, learn lessons, and have fun together. Thank you, Jake. Hey, Jake. 
Jay, thanks so much. Uh, first off, uh, I love the Sox thing to David. Uh, you must have been a great golfer as well back then. <laughs> seeing as you had like uh, your two socks and more than one, one maybe two holes in one. That's not a really bad joke. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> misinterpret optimism toptimism and I'm going to add one more to you because my grandfather who passed at 97 his name was Papa so I called him the poptimist which was he was the most optimistic person I've ever met and the reason was is it wasn't that he saw the glass half full it wasn't that he lied to himself see optimism is something completely different doctor to me optimism is the desire that I must find the light, the love, and the lessons in everything that I want to find. So it's a two-step process for me. It's having that Victor Frankl attitude of man's search for meaning. See, I believe that there's love, light, and lessons in everything. So I, if I want, determined upon my timing and risk tolerance, determined upon what I call the great chain of feeding, if it feeds me, I'm easily going to be able to find the light, the love, and the lessons or it's easily going to be worth it. If it doesn't feed me, now I have a variant decision to make whether how much time and risk I want to put into finding the light, the love, and the lessons. But the biggest benefit of optimism is deciding that something's bleeding me. And the optimist says, I'm going to fire it from my life. See, we spend 80% of our resource of time, emotion, and value on things that bleed us. And if we can learn to shift that over to the things that feed us, we will get exponential results of a greater factor. See, things that bleed us have a negative factor in our life. Things that uh, feed us have a positive factor. I can coach you know, one of the biggest chairmen of one of the biggest companies on earth. And they had a client that literally was a $20 million client. And they had a client that was a $2 billion client. And I asked them, why do you spend so much time, energy, resources, and money on the $20 million client and you barely pay attention to the $2 billion client? And they said, well, the $20 million client's a new client. They're high maintenance. We know they have great growth potential. We want to mature that relationship. So we're spending a lot of resources over here. And the $2 billion client has been with us from the start. They've already grown. And you know what? They don't need much help. I said, I'll tell you what, fire the $20 million client. This is an optimist, he said. Yeah, fire him. So why would you do that? I said, because doing an analysis in the great chain of feeding, if you take all the time, money, resources, and value that you put onto that 20 million client and you put it over the $2 billion client, your $2 billion client, instead of steadily growing, will double quicker. So you'll end up having a $4 billion client when you spend the resources, time, energy, value, and emotion on them and you won't miss the $20 million client at all. So many times in life, not only do we do that with our clients, but we do that with our family. But we do that with our family. We allow the people that trigger our ego-based consciousness, trigger our emotions, bleed us, and they end up putting us at a diminished capacity that we can't even take care of ourselves. Reallocate those resources. At the very least, let family members fall away that bleed us and sink your time, money, energy, and resources and value into the family members that feed us. And this is the best way to be an optimist is to decide where am I going to spend my energy, time, emotion, and value to find the light, the love, and the lessons that exist into everything. And to raise your own awareness of knowing what innately, quantumly, that you love you know, I use an example of if all everyone here on Clubhouse, we went to the Del Mar Fair in San Diego and we walked down the, you know, unhealthy food aisle, we'd walk by the, you know, chocolate fried snicker bar uh, thing and half of us would go, oh my God, I love that. 
and the other half would get a stomach ache just looking at it. Well, that doesn't mean there's not love, light, and lessons in the chocolate fried snicker bar. It just means that half of us innately in our quantum being, what we've inherited energetically and genetically, are attracted to or are aware of or resonate with the frequency of the chocolate fried snicker bar. Now, some of us may choose to try it, even if it seems initially to give us a stomach ache. That's where the optimism lies. The optimism lies in the quantitative analysis of where to spend our time, our energy, our attention and intention into the things that we don't naturally love. Are we willing or able or quantitatively, should we find the light, the love and the lessons? If you can do that, not only can you be an optimist, you can be a toptimist or hopefully even a poptimist in honor of my papa. I appreciate the question, doctor. Thank you so much as always for joining us. Jake, why don't you take a question from the, the webinar? Uh, there's, a, there's so many lining up in there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Connor. Yes, will do, Dave. Okay, Rita from the webinar says, I just recently started to listen to you and appreciate your insight. I know I am very fortunate. My business is successful. Financially, I have more than I could ever imagine, and yet I don't feel happy. You once mentioned some similar situation in the podcast, but just mentioned it briefly. Can you please comment? Yeah, I think the most lost I've ever been was when I had the most uh, monetarily. Uh, and I, I used to tell people, money doesn't buy love or happiness, uh, but it allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right things, you'll be happy. And if you shop for the things you don't need to impress people you don't like, you'll be very unhappy. And that's where I was in my life. I didn't realize I am healthy, happy, worthy, and wealthy. I was still seeking and attaching my emotions to the outcome of I want to be happy, I want to be wealthy, I want to be worthy, I want to be happy. Uh, and I was doing it the wrong way. See, when I felt unhappy, I'd buy more things or different things or things to impress people or impress people I didn't like. One of the things I haven't shared or talked about, one of the things that I've learned along this journey is that it's really not just shopping for the right things. It's shopping with the right reasons, impact, and capabilities in mind. See, I had a great kid uh, that came on one of my shows. His name's Tay Sweat. And, you know, he talked about his transformation. He lost 200 pounds. He borrowed on PayPal $5,000 to get a coach and was making $30,000 within two months. Uh, but he was dead broke and he invested in himself, determined his timing and risk tolerance. Um, and he became happy. Uh, and so it's the re he said to me, I own a Lamborghini. And he said, the reason I own a Lamborghini is because, not because I like driving a Lamborghini, because David, you're right, if you own a Lamborghini, it's expensive to pit fix and it'll break down if you drive it too much or too little. And you're just probably just revealing your anatomy to every girl you date anyway. But the reason why he bought the Lamborghini was he wanted to attract young at-risk kids that would bring credibility because he owned it. So he doesn't really drive it. He just takes pictures in front of it, which I, believe it or not, you know, kind of uh, had judgments and conditions. I did some videos about, hey, man, I don't want to be one of those guys that stands in front of cars I don't own and houses I lease, pretending like what I have, right? I have a friend of mine that, you know, does his mastermind at this estate, and it's a track home, right? You, you know... It doesn't mean anything, right? People who, you know, put out degrees and, and awards that are either paid for or, you know, just fluff, kind of like the best-selling author thing. You know, if anybody wants to be a best-selling author, just call me. You can be one. If anyone wants to be a top 10 listed person in a magazine, just call me. I can do that for you. But what are the reasons that you're shopping for what you want? Not just with money, but with your faith. What are the reasons behind it? Are they based off of gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration? Are they based off of elevating others? Are they based off of being a celebrity or a celebrant? So when we look at the reasons, that's where the fulfillment, the passion, the purpose, and the profitability really come in. When we look at the reasons, then we're capable of truly believing the law of gravity, goya, and allowance that I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? And so that's what I meant in the context of the lowest point of my life, which was the highest point of my bank account, uh, where I was not buying things with the right reasons in mind. 
Now I stopped with the right reasons, both with money, an object of energy that I put into the flow to get what I want, and my faith. Each of those combined and blended together reconcile into passion, purpose, and profitability. They reconcile into the fact that I am healthy, I am happy, I am wealthy, I am worthy. And remember, your health is the most important thing. It's a non-negotiable. If you are healthy, you get millions of wishes. Wishes are the most valuable thing that you have because each wish not only takes nothing into a possibility, but makes it a probability. And it will maintain you through the inspired uh, transition from probability to perspective or reality. Wishes are so valuable. If you are not healthy, I promise you only have one wish. Let's all have millions of wishes and take care of ourselves so we can take care of others. This is David Meltzer. It's Friday. It's BYOQ here on the Breakfast of Champions. I'm so blessed to be a part of this community, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, Dave, we've got a question on uh, the training, and then hopefully there'll be time to answer Nina's question on Clubhouse. Uh, the question is, Dave, how do you get paid for referrals? I love that. See, we can go from the woo-woo down to the stuff that I love, the pragmatic. <laughs> I have an overlap agreement, and... Uh, I've used it ever since I regretted and had a need to be offended from all the people that I helped and made millions and even billions of dollars and I felt as if I was cheated because I didn't get any of it. So instead, I started to manage and develop a uh, relationship uh, and codify it by creating an overlap agreement for all the instances where I would make a referral or help somebody. And I just codified it up front and said, would it be worth, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20% if I made an introduction to you or uh, if I procured business for you? Does that sound fair? And look, I'm just codifying, not because I don't trust the other person, right? I just do it because I do so many of these deals. I want to remember who I promised to do what for and what I promised to do and what they promised to do for me. This has changed my life. And as I've been doing this for over a decade now, it's amazing seven and now I'm getting close to eight figures of the quantitative value of helping other people. Uh, it's okay to receive, right? What, one of the greatest lessons that I learned was the more I give, the more I receive. Uh, the problem was my mom didn't teach me the rule before that, which is you can't give what you don't have. And so my objective now is to receive first, appreciate what I receive, which expands it because I'm adding value to what I receive which creates a bigger uh, void, and then giving away acknowledges, remembers, and reminds me what I had, but it allows for more room to receive more. So before you can give more to receive more, you have to receive. It's just like before you can react, you need your initial action uh, in whatever prayer meditation or whatever that may be in order to determine the plateau and grow of your life. My first action is to have an unwinding routine to start my tomorrow today at 9 p.m. by unwinding, putting my mind, my body, and my soul in a position to plateau and grow the next day, not live that myth of Sisyphus, getting stuck like Brielle talked about, but instead plateauing and growing, accelerating, expanding, compounding the positive behaviors in my life to create exponential results. All right, Jake, we've got time for one quick more. Yeah. This, oh, thank you, Nina. This is really my failure to communicate. Um, so people ask me that question all the time. So, I, I, you know, I'm not explaining that correctly. Detach your emotions from the outcome. Detach your emotions from the outcome. You should absolutely have intermediate and long-term goals that are effectuated by taking inventory daily of what those are. You need to know your what daily, personally, experientially, giving and receiving. You need to know who can help me and who can I help. How can I get it done by being a student in my calendar, effectuating the mathematical equation of luck. Then you can create the prioritization of what's important in your life and then make those decisions accordingly and utilize your productivity, accessibility, and gratitude, effectively aligning it supplementary and synergistic to what you want. And applying your why, not attaching your why to the outcome that I'll be happy when I make a million dollars. I'll be happy when, no, I am happy 
consistently every day, persistently without quit, pursuing making over a million dollars is much different than I'll be happy when I get it. And so when we talk about detachment, it's solely the emotions that you detach your why from the outcome and put it into the journey, into the consistent, persistent pursuit of that outcome. When you can put those emotions there, you are detaching your emotions from the outcome and placing them on the law of attraction, Goya and faith in order to effectuate accelerating, exponentially growing and allowing yourself to decrease the resistance or interference of what you already have because you are already connected to and through everything. You are living between limitlessness and infinity. The problem is you have created the pretext of crumbs that you think that you have to limit yourself to making a billion dollars in your lifetime. No, it's crumbs. Go ahead and expand and grow. Make your reality surpass other people's imagination. Detach your emotions into the activities instead of detaching it and attaching it to the outcome. That's what I meant by that. There's a perfect blend of patience and persistence when you enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of your potential. All right, everyone, this is David Meltzer. It's 7 o'clock. I went a couple minutes over. Thank you for your patience. Please join me every Friday here on The Breakfast of Champions on IG Live, LinkedIn, and of course, over 50,000 people on the webinar registered here. I appreciate all the questions. If you did not get your questions answered, email me david at dmelcher.com. I will answer every single question myself, david at dmelcher.com. The templates that I offered, anything that you want, please reach out to me. Book, audiobook, I'll sign a book, send it to you, pay for shipping. I don't care. Please reach out. I'm here to be of service and of value. And this is the communicate that I value the mo- community that I value the most. Thank you, Jake, Glenn, Riel, everyone else, Amelia. I appreciate, love you. Be kind to your future self and do good deeds. Close it out, Jake.